Hello and welcome everyone to our PowerShell 101 webinar with the fabulous Garth Schulte. My name is Karen Klinger and I am your designated chat wrangler today. So be sure to chat in with your questions and we'll do our best to get to those questions toward the end of our time together. We are recording today's webinar and the recording will be available later this week on our blog at blog.cbtnuggets.com. And with that, I'll hand it over to Garth. Garth, it's all yours. Karen, you are awesome. Thank you. Hey, everybody, everyone. Thanks for joining us here on uh, this lovely Tuesday. We're going to talk about PowerShell. Hopefully, convince you that now's the time to get some PowerShell skills because as time goes on, everybody's going to need them. So let's start this webinar off with a little poll. How about this? A live poll. What kind of IT pro are you? Admin, developer, DBA, everything other. Go ahead and Click away. We've got a lot of admins in here. Wow. That's, which is expected. Totally. That's the weapon of choice these days for admins. A couple developers, DBA, a lot of everything. It's cool. I'm going to do this as well. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and put in uh, everything. All right. Good deal. Fun. These live polls are fun, aren't they? Cool. So, Admins obviously here is a big part of, uh, of PowerShell. This is, this is the audience that uh, latched on to PowerShell first. But the thing about PowerShell is it really is for everybody. And so that's what we're going to look at in this webinar, talk about what PowerShell is, what it's about, some of the features, and we'll go over some of the basics, and we'll even give you a little demo at the end. Let's get to it. And obviously we'll take some questions here at the end too. So the, the, the biggest thing to note about PowerShell, and, and, and the whole reason it exists is for automation, right? It's to help us do our jobs quicker, better, more efficient. And, uh, and the people that are going to get left behind here are the GUI people, GUI admins or GUI pros as we call them. So here's an example. Let's say you create a user in Active Directory. How long is it going to take you to do that? Probably 30 seconds if you're quick, maybe a minute if you're not. Multiply that by 500. So you've got 500 users to create. That's going to take you all day, probably longer. In PowerShell, you can do it in seconds. You can import them in literally seconds in one line, which is uh, pretty amazing. So we're going to start a campaign right here. No GUI pro left behind. Get away from the GUIs and into the command line, the shell, the PowerShell. A couple of interesting quotes here. First of all, this is right from, right from Books Online here. Get my pen out. Right there. Books Online, PowerShell, what is it? It's a task-based command line shell and scripting language in one. This is a really cool quote from a Microsoft exec that says, it's safe to say the single most important skill we're going to need in the coming years is proficiency with PowerShell. And this is just a quote from me. Every time I see PowerShell, I call it the blue screen of love because that's what it is. <laughs> it's awesome. But what, what really is it? It's a shell. Right? But it's not your, your typical shell. It's not the traditional shell such as, uh, such as a Linux shell like Bash or even the legacy command prompt that I'm sure we've, we've all used in our days to, to run IP config or ping a machine. Right? Because traditional shells, they output text, which makes it extremely difficult to do things like formatting and filtering and working with that data. Now there are tools that can help you get the job done in those old school shells like set and grep. I'm sure you've all heard of those. But it takes years to master things like regular expressions to do any sort of heavy text parsing. PowerShell takes advantage of .NET. It's built on top of the .NET framework and it uses objects to represent data, which as you'll see shortly, makes life fun, more efficient, easy in the world of Windows. Something that's really interesting here, and, uh, and this, is, this is a big deal. It's at the core of all of Microsoft products. Not all of them yet, but it will eventually be underneath everything. In fact, all the GUIs that we play with today are really just executing PowerShell commands underneath. And that just opens the door for some really interesting interactions uh, that we're going to talk about here shortly. PowerShell also has a wide and deep reach. We can reach thousands of computers using one command. We can also hit things that aren't exposed in the GUI. Right? The GUI is great for learning the product and, and for quick one-offs, but when you really need to get deep into a product and, 
and, and you need to automate things, there's no real good way to do it right now. And well, there is now with PowerShell, but in the past there wasn't any good way to do it without development skills. Obviously here this is Microsoft's vision for the future of automation. It really is the Microsoft standard for automation. PowerShell is literally everywhere and underneath everything. And because of that it's going to enable interactivity and automation between everything. Machines, networks, the cloud, and even products. How cool would it be to write a PowerShell script that does something, Exchange, SQL Server, Windows, all of them you can hit from a single script. It's also much safer than GUIs. Has anybody ever done anything in, in, in a GUI and accidentally drag and dropped maybe something in Active Directory? And then you're, you're like, uh-oh. And you're, you're spending hours trying to put everything back? Yeah, GUIs can be dangerous. Really dangerous, especially when you're, you're in an RDP session and it's lagging and you're clicking all over and, and you're clicking things you didn't mean to. Yeah, exactly. So PowerShell is much, much safer than GUIs. It's also for everybody. Again, not just admins, but developers can take advantage of it, DBAs, network engineers, anybody that works in a Windows environment can take advantage of PowerShell and become more efficient. And obviously it's going to make our life easier. That's, that's the whole goal here of PowerShell. It's going to make us and the tasks we perform better, faster, simpler, and repeatable. Another big thing, everything you learn applies to everything else. Once you get the hang of PowerShell's conventions and syntax, they apply across products, additions, versions, everything. So one of the beautiful things about PowerShell is it's easy to learn, number one, but you're constantly building on that as you go. And, and things you learned years ago will still apply in the future. Let's start here with the tools. So the first thing you're going to do when you get into PowerShell is, is, is open up the tool, right? And, and everybody I'm sure has seen that little blue icon down in the taskbar that comes installed with all these newer versions of Windows. But you know, if a lot of people are going to be hesitant first to, to click on it and do something. You probably open it up and say, oh wow, this is, this is command.exe only it's blue. And then close out of it and go back to command.exe, right? Well, it, it, it's command.exe and oh so much more. But this is where you'll start on the console. This is our command line interface, the official shell. It's good for getting in and just quickly getting things done. And you also have some nice features in there such as tab completion, but it's still the old shell, right? So you're still going to struggle with copy and paste. You're not going to have all these great productivity features like IntelliSense and, and all kinds of things. So this is where our other tool here, which a lot of people think it's kind of like, you know, this is, this is a developer tool for creating scripts. It isn't, it isn't, because you can use it to create scripts, yes, but you can still use it to do things that you do in the standard shell, the, the official shell here. We get all the extra benefits, though, of a true scripting environment. Syntax highlighting, content sensitive help. We've got a nice little command browser here so we can see uh, how to use commands, the parameters, and switches that they take. And, and it can essentially write it for us. We can insert it. And it's a, a really great and easy way to learn about all the commands out there. And there's a lot of other ways, too, which we'll talk about here shortly. But we also get copy and paste. And it's really, it's the CLI, right, this blue thing over here, as well as the scripting environment in one tool. And, and this isn't all there is that's out there, but this is what Microsoft provides us. There's a lot of other third-party tools out there that can make our lives easier in PowerShell. But, but these are the two big ones that you'll get started with. <clears throat> now let's move on to the basics. PowerShell is all about this little thing called commandlets. Right? These are essentially native commands built in the .NET framework that spit out objects. We'll talk about objects here in the, the next, uh, next area. But there's really two big things. There's commandlets and then there's applications. Commandlets are what we all will be using quite a bit. Again, they're native to PowerShell and, uh, and, and they're awesome. You'll see here shortly, I'll give you some good demos. And, uh, and then applications are what we were, we were used to from the old command IDXE, right? Here's an example of just running ping. But the point here is that you no longer need to open up command.exe. You don't need that old black wannabe shell anymore because we have PowerShell. You can do everything you can do in that plus so much more because it's PowerShell and we have commandlets to work with. Now, remember that I was mentioning about uh, objects? It's an object-based shell. Well, here's the thing. Objects aren't just text data. They're a lot more than that. They're structured data. But they can also do things, right? We can we can perform actions against them. So here's a good example. 
Let's say we want to get all the services on the system. We could run the git service commandlet, pass in whatever services or ser service or services we're looking for. We have wildcard support there. So just running this simple commandlet will bring back these four objects. Now these are objects that we can then pass to other commands. And this is where the pipeline comes into play. This is, this is the big thing about PowerShell is understanding how the pipeline works. And this is where all that power comes in uh, because essentially what we have here is a way to get all the objects, right? So you'll run git service or git event logs or git computers out of Active Directory. Uh, there's git uh, SQL servers, git exchange servers. I mean there's tons and tons of things we can do to query our infrastructure to get whatever we want. So this first command you're going to execute is known as the getter. Right? It's going to go and get some data. And that data is going to be objects. And then we can pipe those objects to another commandlet to do more things to it. In this case, we're going to do a filter, a where object. And we're going to say, you know what? Give us all the objects where the status equals stop. And this is going to discard any objects that don't meet that criteria, and that will give us one object. And here's kind of a, a visual representation of what would happen here. Get service will give us three running objects and one stop object, which we see right up there. Then we use a pipeline to pass those objects here, which will give us one. And then we can use another pipeline to pass that object here to the start service commandlet, which will then try uh, to start that service. So you can see the pipeline is powerful, but combined with objects, it makes it easy to work with because it's not a text-based shell. We don't have to parse all this text to, to, to get what we want. So it makes combining or connecting commands very, very simple. And you can do a lot with one line, which is uh, pretty cool stuff. Now along your journey in learning PowerShell, you're going to come across a lot of things, a lot of features. There's some really interesting features here in PowerShell to help us do everything from automate to get some juicy information out of whatever product or operating system or even hardware that we're working with. But let's go over a few of these because they are pretty cool. So remoting is neat. Remoting is, uh, is what's going to allow us to execute a command against many, many machines, against our entire network, against parts of our network. And we can do this in a number of ways. Uh, but remoting is the safest and most efficient way to do it. Actually, let me go back a slide just to show you something here. Uh, there's a, I don't have it in here, but there is a computer name parameter that you can pass in, and you can pass in a list of computer names, right? And so we could run a get service against all the machines in our network, and it'll pull back all the services that meet that criteria for all those machines. Well, that uses something known as a DCOM and RPC, right? So it's a, it's a call that uses Microsoft technologies and standards, and, uh, and it's good, but the problem is it'll run into problems outside of your internal network. It'll, it, uh, it won't pass firewalls and security systems and things like that. So remoting is the secure way of doing it because it communicates through HTTP and SOAP and uses uh, industry standards to do so. And so remoting is going to be the, the, the powerful thing that we're eventually going to use to hit many, many machines in our network. Workflow is another really cool one. Uh, workflow is built on Windows Workflow Foundation, and uh, essentially what it allows us to do is work with long-running scripts that persist across things like power outages or system restarts. We can create a script that checkpoints between commands, and then when those systems come back up, it will continue working just as it did before. Another great feature there. We also have something known as providers. Providers uh, gives us a standard view. It treats it just like a drive, right? Just like, just like folders and files and directory, the hierarchical structure that we're all used to inside of Windows. Well, providers allows us to essentially tap into anything, such as the registry, uh, such as a certificate store, whatever, and give us that same consistent view uh, no matter what the underlying structure of that data model is. And it's very easy to work with. It's literally like mapping drives to a source and then just working with that data. WI and CIM, another great one here. Windows Management Instrumentation. This is, uh, this is something, this is a Microsoft implementation of SIM standards. SIM is the Common Information Model. Essentially, it's a, a vendor neutral industry standard way of representing management information in a system, right, inside of the operating system or the hardware. We have WMI and CIM commandlets that we can use to tap in and get this information or get access to that functionality. Very easy to do. We also have updatable and savable help. 
PowerShell's greatest asset is its help system. And, uh, and, and it makes learning it very, very easy. And it's always up to date. So we can easily get the most uh, up to date information about a commandlet. And, and I, I'm going to give you an example here, but oh man, the help system is just dynamic. It's incredible. And, uh, and I tell you, it's one of the things that you'll be using every day when you're working with PowerShell. In fact, uh, one thing you should do if you do get into PowerShell is try to learn to commandlet a day or commandlet a week. Just because you, you'll see as time goes on, you're going to learn all of the common foundational stuff, right? And then when you start learning new commandlets, you'll know half of that command. You'll know what it does. You'll know these common switches and parameters and, and the syntax and the conventions. And it'll just be learning specific things about that commandlet. We also have background and scheduled jobs here. Uh, obviously, background jobs are great for those long-running tasks. We don't have to sit there and wait for them. We can even schedule them across our network, another great area here. And then uh, one of the new features that came out here in PowerShell version 4 is the desired state configuration. Oh, this feature is, uh, is the future for administration. So check this out. Let's say that uh, we've got a bunch of machines out there. And we expect those machines to be in a specific state all the time, right? We want, say we want IIS to have this specific web page at all times. We want a specific feature installed on the server. And the problem that this solves is configuration drift, which is over time, people fight fires, they go, they, they change settings, they do all that kind of stuff. And over time, our machine is in the state that we don't want it to be in because you know, things change over time. So this is a feature that ensures that machine always stays in that state. So let's, uh, let's say that, uh, for instance, somebody comes in and they change a the setting in your SQL Server because they're fighting a the fire. They need to give it more memory. And they don't change it back. Well, we can set up desired state configuration to monitor that machine and say every half hour, make sure that those settings are what we told it to be. And in a half hour, it will change them back. Same with the web server. Say someone accidentally uninstalled IIS. Guess what? It will reinstall it in the background under the hood and get it right back to that initial state. Now, the real power here is down the road. Down the road, imagine this. Imagine you've got a machine out there and you need to get it to initial state, install a bunch of things on it, add some Windows features, maybe put Exchange on it, SQL Server, maybe put a web server on it. You know, you want this machine to look like this. You can declaratively configure it in a PowerShell script how you want it to work. Then you just say, you just deploy it. And there's two models here. There's a push model, which is just a one-time manual thing, and a pull model. So, uh, so these servers, the, your clients can come and, and pull the server every now and then to get those changes. But we just push that configuration file out and boom, that, that machine magically configures and installs everything you need, gets it to that point, and then keeps it at that point over time. This is pretty powerful stuff. So keep an eye out for this because it's only getting better as we, uh, as we continue to get more PowerShell versions. That's going to be a very, very big deal going forward and a, and a huge deal for all of us to have. Huge time saver. Nobody likes to fight fires, right? <laughs> and when you do, you want to make sure that the machine goes back to where it was when you're done. And so those, that's just a, a small handful of some of the big features. There's many, many more, and we keep getting more with new versions. What are some of the things we can do with PowerShell? Well, we can work with the operating system. Again, anything from working with features inside of Windows to network administration to file systems to managing Active Directory to integrating and connecting applications. As I mentioned earlier, and of course, working with Azure, we've got an Azure pack that we can uh, a module that we can bring over and install in the PowerShell, and boom, we've got access to all of Microsoft's clouds from a local machine to automate things. So you can connect, you know, on-prem to, to cloud, set up your hybrid scenarios. You can automate it all with PowerShell. That's essentially what I'm getting at here. Now, um, learning to learn, as I mentioned, PowerShell is very, very learning friendly. Once you learn how to learn PowerShell by using the help system you can learn things very, very quickly. And these, there's three commands here that you're going to start with. I would recommend everybody get familiar with these three commands right here. Get command, get help, and get memory. I'll give you a demo of each one of these here at the end of this uh, webinar. But essentially, if you get proficient in these three commands, there's no stopping you. The sky's the limit as far as what you can learn here in PowerShell. That's a great starting point because you see a lot of people when they get into PowerShell, they open it up and they say, now what? What do I do? And, and this, is, this is what you do right here. Get help. Get command and get memory. Get command is kind of a search engine on top of all the commandlets and, and even external commands 
uh, inside of PowerShell that PowerShell can access. GitHelp allows us to see all, everything there is from syntax to the, a description of all the parameters to even examples. And then GitMember describes the object. Because a lot of times when you are outputting information, you may not want the default view. Right? You may not just want the name of the service and the, the state of the service. You may want to get the, the dependencies of a service, that kind of thing. So, so GitMember will help you understand what that object is capable of. And I just threw another uh, three really simple commandlets that uh, every admin should know to get a handle of services, processes, and event logs. And they are all very easy commandlets to use. All right, who is ready for a demo? Here is what we are going to do. I have got right here next to me a Hyper-V server with five servers. We have got the nuggetlab.local domain. We have got a domain controller. We have got uh, an application server. We have got a file server. And we have got a couple of clients. And these all span different operating systems. So CL7 is Windows 7. CL8 is Windows 8. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to I'll show you how we can search for commands using get command. Show you how to view help for a command will be the object property. So we we'll use those three commandlets that I was just talking about to help you get started here with PowerShell. We'll look at how to execute a command. We'll execute a command across many machines. We'll query Active Directory for, for some machines, and then we'll send a ping across the entire network. And you'll just you'll, you'll see how easy this is. So let me go ahead and share my uh, my desktop here. All right, everybody, see this? All right, cool. So here's the network, right? I'm using uh, RDP RDP man here. Connection Manager. So here's our App Nugget, Windows Server 2012, CL7. This is a uh, Windows 7. Here's a Windows 8.1. Here's our Domain Controller, and here's our File Server. So we've got three Windows Server 2012 R2s and a couple of client machines. So we're going to do this all from a CL8, so from our client, our Windows 8.1 client. And what I did here is just opened up the ISC. Now here's here's regular PowerShell. Here's what we all uh, probably see down here in the in the taskbar. There it is, right? So in here we could just start executing commands in here. But what I want to do because this is, this is a better tool since we get all of those awesome uh, features, is the ISC, the Integrated Scripting Environment. So over here on the right are all of our commands. Here's our command add-on that I was talking about here. So you can come in here and start searching for commands. So we could say, uh, let's, let's say we wanted to find Git Service. There it is, Git Service. And we could click on it and we could see all the parameters that's associated with it and uh, some other things in here. And we could start filling these in and hit insert and it will write it for us. But let me get rid of that window just to give us a, a nice clean view here. And let's start by just searching for commands. So here, if we just run get command, and this, by the way, F8 or the second button, run selection, this one will run the entire script. And uh, we're just going to do these as one off. So I'm going to hit this or F8 on the keyboard. And there it is. There's every single commandlet on this machine. And since I'm running this, I already downloaded uh, the remote server administration tools, RSAT. So that's why I have the ability here to access Active Directory. We've got all kinds of Active Directory commandlets inside of here. But notice one thing about commandlets. They all go with the verb noun naming convention. And this is what makes it really easy to learn things uh, and find things here in PowerShell. Because you already you know, know what you are looking for before you are even looking for it. So if you are looking to do something like find uh, all the commandments with computer, maybe we want to query Active Directory, or maybe we want to add a computer to the, to the domain, we can say, all right, well, let's just find it here. Let's do a git command, computer with some wildcard characters. I'll hit F8. And look at that. There's all the commandments associated with computer. So there's get ad computer. I can guess what that does. Probably gets an Active Directory computer, right? Remove computer, remove ad computer. This removes it from the domain. This adds it to the domain. A lot of other uh, things that we can do inside of here relating to computer. But notice also this pulled back applications. These are just regular old uh, command line utilities. And then we can get more specific with our search here. We can say, you know what, give me all the commands that have the noun computer in it. And what this will do, since we're saying now in here that we're looking specifically for commandlets, so this will get application out of there, and uh, and just give us everything where the noun uh, has computer in it. So there it is. All these are computer-based commandlets. And we could also do that with verb. So we could say we want anything with add in it with the noun computer in it, and there it is. Now we're down to three here. There's uh, Windows Update. There's uh, add computer to the domain, and there's add a computer service account inside of Active Directory. And you can see the module that's associated with there. So very easy to search for commands. Now once you find the command you're looking for, what if we wanted to get help? Here we go. We can just run get help, add computer. Let's see what this add computer does here. We'll run that. And by the way, you can run an update help. First thing you should do, run update help. That will download all the help, get you updated here for all the modules in PowerShell. But this will uh, just give us a brief overview, a name, a synopsis, a couple of different ways to use it with the different parameter sets, and a brief description. We can even do full here, by the way, because that's just to give you very simple help. 
You can do full. That will give you full help. You can also do examples. See that? That will give us just the examples. So here's a lot of different ways to use it to add a server into the domain, or add many, many servers into the domain, right? You can also uh, look for specific parameters here. Let's say we wanted to find out what that force parameter is all about. We could do a help, which is, by the way, an alias for get help. Add computer parameter force. What that'll do is give us information on just this parameter. Check it out. Suppresses the user confirmation prompt, and then some properties associated with that. And you can also run a, run a show window. This is really cool because this will pop up the help in a separate window. Really nice when you're trying to uh, work with the command. You can have them side by side here, and you can. Get a good reference there so you're not scrolling up and down inside of the CLI there. Very cool. All right, so that's help. Uh, another thing here, how about viewing an object's properties? Let's run get service. Well, yeah, there's all the services on my local Windows 8 machine here. And now let's say uh, we want to run get service and just find any service with the name event. And by the way, name is a positional parameter, meaning we wouldn't actually have to provide this name. We could just put event like we were doing with get command up there, then we get the same results. But there we go. Here's two services with event inside of the name. So the event log and event system there. And let's say we wanted to run that against three of our machines. Here's that computer name parameter I was mentioning. This will run it against all three of those machines. There it is. Look at that. Now we don't know what machine name it is, but we could easily get that machine name. How? Because we could run a get member, which will take any of those objects, pipe it to this get member command right here, and now we'll be able to see what is inside of this object. And we can say, hmm, does this have a machine name? It sure does. Look at that. Right? about there. So that means we will run the same command. This is the beautiful thing about PowerShell. You can just keep building on your commands and executing them interactively to learn. Pretty cool stuff. All right, so here we're going to do it again. We'll do GSV this time, which is an alias for get service, by the way. Pass an event log, specify these three machines, and then we're going to use the select, which allows us to pick and choose what properties we want in our output. So same ones, display name, status, but we're going to add machine name in there. And then we're going to sort by machine name, and then we're going to format this as a list. Look at all that. So we've got quite a bit of uh, commands connected together there. And here's the result. So all three of our machines, app nugget, DC nugget, FS nugget, the ones we told it to go look for, and then the data we told it to retrieve, sorted by machine name here, app nugget, DC nugget, FS nugget, and then it formatted it as a list rather than a table. Cool. Now what if we wanted to stop the services across all these machines? Same thing. We just piped this to the stop service commandlet, but this is a great little, great little trick here. See this what if? Oh no, I lost my, uh, my connection here. One second, I'm going to get it back. Where did you go? But anyway, the what if parameter allows us to, uh, to essentially run it without running it. So it's just going to pretend to run it. So that's a really safe parameter that uh, everybody should get familiar with when you're doing things like stopping services, right? You just want to see what would happen, not actually make it happen. All right, I think I got us back here. Let's see. Boom, I did it. Cool. All right. So if we run this, there it is. So it, 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 this is what would have happened. It would have stopped the service on these machines, but we can see what it would have did without actually doing it. If we took that what if parameter off, you guessed it. It would stop the event log service on all three of those machines. Two more quick ones here. Query Active Directory. Here's one. Get AD computer. Pass in the filter for everything. We're going to extract the operating system property here, and we're going to say give us back the name and operating system Format as a table and auto size it. There we go. It just queried Active Directory, and you can see all three, uh, all five of those machines and their operating systems. We got three with Windows Server 2012, one with 8.1 Pro, 1.7 Professional, and finally here, the last one thing we're going to do is run a ping. Only here's the cool thing. I've got inside of a uh, script here, or inside of a text file. Let me just go into the C drive. Where are you, C drive? Scripts, servers. So I listed our three servers inside of this text file. Right? Cool. So what we're going to do is run a test connection, which is essentially ping here, the, the, the ping commandlet inside of, uh, inside of PowerShell. And then we'll use the computer name, computer name parameter, and then inside of Prentice here, get content. This will actually go and get the data out of that text file that we specified, pass it to the computer name parameter, and run a ping across all of those machines. There we go. We just pinged our whole network in one command. Pretty cool, right? So that's PowerShell 101. Karen, you with me? I went a little long. Sorry about you. that. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> you're you're awesome, and I think this has been so so helpful. Um, and we actually have some questions. Do you have a few minutes to give us some questions, guys? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll hang around as long as uh, as long as you guys let me. Okay, fantastic. Well, Dan actually asked uh, fairly early on in the presentation, 
why is PowerShell better than a GUI and safer? Ah, well, there's a lot of reasons uh, that we kind of mentioned in there, but it's it's better because it's quicker. Number one, you can. Did you see what we just did here with some of these things? But uh, I, I think the biggest thing with a GUI is that it's slow. It's slow. You're never going to be able to do things in a GUI as fast as you can do them in PowerShell. Plus, you can automate them. Right. So, so once you start getting familiar and you start writing these commands, you're going to save them. You're going to you're going to get a little script directory going on a file server somewhere, and you are going to build up a library of things that you commonly do. And then in your quiet time, you can say, "All right, I've been doing that way too much this week. Let's automate it. Let's turn that into a job." Uh, and, and even for one-off things, which GUIs are good for, but even for one-off things, you can still make a little script and then just go change the parameters for your one-off that you're doing now and automate it. Much easier to just double-click on that script to run it than it is to, you know, fire up that GUI if you have the GUI around and you don't have to go to another computer to get access to it. Then, you know, it's just it, it, PowerShell's it. PowerShell's the future for management. Awesome. Okay. So Angel actually asked, is there a new PowerShell course being developed by Garth? Hey, there is. There is. In fact, uh, just this week we're starting uh, PowerShell 4 Foundations. We're going to go over all the basics and a little bit beyond the PowerShell, including some of the new features in 4, such as, as, as I was talking about there, the desired state configuration. We're going to get into DSC pretty heavily, which is something that everybody needs to understand if they're a Windows admin because it's just so powerful. It's, it's going to be some really neat things here uh, coming on in the future. Fantastic. That's actually kind of a nice segue too. Uh, David asked, for maybe some beginners such as himself and fellow classmates who are also joining the webinar, where is a good starting point for someone completely new to PowerShell to learn? Maybe with a course outside of creating their own virtual lab. Yeah, uh, actually, as I mentioned here, the help system is a great way to get started. If you can just get in there and run git command and then run git help against that command, you'd be surprised at how quickly you can learn things. Um, and, and you know, all these latest versions of Windows come with PowerShell. So it's not like you need to go and build your own lab. You can just fire it up and work with anything. Windows 8, Windows 10, Windows 7, I mean all these things have PowerShell in it. So you don't even need a lab full of a, a network of machines to test and play on your own. Um, awesome. Great all right, we've got a few more here. Uh, Dale asks, where can you get documentation on all the capabilities and command line options? Yeah, the help. The help. Uh, as I mentioned here and as we did inside of our demo, everything here is inside. This is, this is, PowerShell is really known for its help system. It's, it's something that they put a lot of time and effort in because they know this isn't stuff that's that you're going to learn overnight. So they made it really easy to almost learn overnight. In a week, you can be deadly in PowerShell because uh, there's not a lot to learn. There, there is. There's a lot of commandlets out there. But as far as the getting familiar with the syntax and getting familiar with the conventions and learning how to connect commands in the pipeline and all the little nuances there, it doesn't take much. Once you get past that area, uh, I, I mean, you're going to go from zero to a hundred to a thousand. So you're going to, you know. You're going to grow exponentially with PowerShell as long as you stick with it. Just put a little bit of time in every day or every week, and, uh, and you'll see those skills will skyrocket in no time. Awesome. I feel like that's really great advice for a lot of areas, but especially with PowerShell. Um, Donna asks, what would be your best suggestion for students who are learning to use PowerShell in a server administration class or just beginning, beginning in the field of server admin field? Oh, repeat that one. I lost you there for a minute. Oh, sorry. Uh, what would be your best suggestions to students who are learning to use PowerShell in a server administration class or just beginning in the field of server admin? Uh, yeah, same thing there. I mean, you know, Google search it, uh, watch some of our stuff. I mean, that's the, the get into PowerShell because GUIs are, are where people get comfortable, right? Because it's, it's, it's a GUI. It's, Next, next, finish. They guide us through it. I know PowerShell can be extremely intimidating when you open it up and there you go, you just got a bunch of text. What do you do? But uh, mm -hmm. I've got a couple of friends who I've been trying to get into PowerShell that aren't sysadmins. They want to become sysadmins. I show them a few commands and they're like, whoa, okay, that's, that's pretty cool that you can do that and, and get all this information on your system without going into the GUIs. And I'm like, watch this. And I'll add that computer name parameter and hit four computers in one little command and they're blown away. So. Uh, my advice is really, really just get in and play. Just get in and get your hands wet and, and 
you know, execute some of these simple commands like getting event logs and getting services. And, and once you get familiar with some of those simple commands, you'll get the confidence to go deeper and uh, learn some of the more advanced stuff. Awesome. And Dan asks, even though this is a Microsoft product, will it also start services for other vendors such as VMware? Yes, absolutely. There's, that's another thing I really wanted to mention that I didn't get to is PowerShell is extremely extensible. Right? So anybody, anybody from third-party vendors to even developers can build these modules and we can import them. In fact, Microsoft does it for all their products. VMware has a bunch of things, uh, a bunch of uh, modules that you can import and work with. And, uh, and you can even do it from Linux and even hit Linux things from PowerShell. So it's extensible, it's open, and uh, there's, really, there's not going to be any limit in the future as far as what we can hit from PowerShell, especially in a Windows environment. But yes, all these third-party vendors and, and, uh, and, and like I said, even developers can just open up .NET and easily build a command line tailored to whoever they're building it for. So even us, if you have any .NET skills, it's very easy to build your own command line. And even if you don't have any .NET skills, you can still build your own modules uh, inside of uh, PowerShell using PowerShell's scripting language here. Fantastic. Super simple. Do you have time for a few more here, Gary? Absolutely. Awesome. Well, as you're talking, more and more questions are just rolling in, so we're having a good time with this. Um, CD asked, what are some good resources for SCCM 2012 PowerShell scripts and functions? Uh, Microsoft has a gallery out there. I don't remember the URL off the top of my head. Just Google it, PowerShell scripts or PowerShell repository. Um, but they've got, uh, they've got it broken out by area. So if you're into SQL Server, if you're into System Center, you can limit your search results down to those products. And there are some really great simple scripts to get started in there as well, just to get familiar with some of the things you can do across all these products, uh, like System Center, for instance. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a big module that uh, you know, there's a lot of interest around that. So. Fantastic. Um, actually, I think uh, Tommy asked, um, for an absolute beginner, what resource can I use to learn how to properly write PowerShell syntax? Oh, that's a good one. Um, let's see, there's a, Microsoft has a lot of resources. Books Online is, is, isn't the greatest. Uh, and I think the reason for that is because the help system is so dynamic. But I'll just keep saying that. Get into PowerShell and use Get Help. Get Help is your best friend. Start with Get Command to find what commands you're looking for, and then just get into Get Help. Because the syntax in there, uh, once you do a full on your help, it will describe all the switches, all the parameters. But really, if you want to get in and, and understand you know, what the, the squiggly brackets are, when to use parentheses, what the open brackets are, to really get familiar with the syntax, uh, I would say uh, Google it or get a book or watch our other courses because we're, we go over all that stuff as well. Awesome. Uh, and James asked, how and where do you get the command add-on for the ISE? Oh, oh, it's built right in. It's built right in. See this right here, this button, this last button on the toolbar will open and close it. There it is. So it's built into the ISE here. Um, so yeah, you don't have to go get it. Thankfully, built right in. Just, just a little a tip here. When you fire up, let me close out of this. When you fire up PowerShell, you can right click and hit Run ISE as administrator. Right? Always run your, your PowerShell, uh, whether it's the console or the ISE or any other third party tool, run them as administrator. Otherwise, uh, it probably won't work. You're just rolling right through these questions, Garth. I love it. Um, uh, you know, I've I've got a deep love for PowerShell. <laughs> That's good. And I got to I got uh, to the game late too. I know a lot of people that got to the game late, but it's it's never too late for PowerShell because it's still the beginning. It really didn't catch on until PowerShell version three came out. PowerShell one was in two thousand and six. PowerShell two not long after that, but nobody really cared. <laughs> but the last couple of years, people are starting to care. So now is a, a better time than any to get into it. All right. Howard asked, um, how can we find what to do with WMI or other unknown items others are using? Uh, oh, again, there's, there's another good one. Just run a git command. Git command, type in WC, uh, WMI. So here we go. Let's do it right here. Git command, tab completion. And uh, let's do a star WMI. 
and I'll just hit F8 to execute that. Boom, look at that. There's all the objects. So here we go, get WMI object right here. See that? So now we could run a get help against get WMI object and see all the things we can do against WMI there. And we could do the same thing with sim. But uh, yeah, these are very, very popular uh, commandlets to get familiar with in PowerShell because you, know, you can extract and then work with anything at the hardware or software layer in Windows. All right. We're getting down there now. Uh, Michael asks, does PS remoting open up security vulnerabilities? Is there a reason a larger company would want to keep it disabled? Uh, it used to, I, I shouldn't say it used to, but with remoting, it uses, it goes over HTTP, and it uses a, a, a very well-known standard known as WSMAN, right, which is the web service, essentially uh, Microsoft uses SOAP and HTTP for this communication. So if you use web services, it's no less secure than that. It's actually even more secure. It's incredibly secure these days. Um, in fact, here's a good one for you guys. If you uh, Google Jeffrey Snover, who's the, uh, the guy who built PowerShell, he has some great talks about security and PowerShell and how you have absolutely no concerns. Uh, it's, it's extremely, extremely secure. The only thing you need to be concerned about is people with too much power uh, and not enough experience who may accidentally you know, forget the what-if switch and stop all the services and all the machines in the network. <laughs> but that's, that's a whole other ball of wax. But as far as PowerShell itself, extremely, extremely secure. And notice actually uh, with all these latest versions of server coming out, all this stuff is actually enabled by default. They're so confident that it's secure, that all the stuff used to be shut off, right? And it was, it was difficult to do anything to configure it, to turn it on. But all this stuff is coming enabled now. So you can just fire up PowerShell and start executing commands across the network as long as you have administrative you know, credentials in the domain. All right. Yeah, security is always a big concern. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, oh, whoops, we already answered that question. Um, Russ asks, do any services or firewall settings need to be configured to run PowerShell commands against remote computers? <laughs> yes, if you use this computer parameter that I was talking about, computer name, in fact, here, watch this, let's do a get service computer name. See this parameter right here? This is what I was talking about earlier. This is built into a lot of commandlets. And uh, in here we could do, you know, we could run all of our computer names in here. But the problem here is this uses DCOM and RPC, which is not firewall friendly. And I don't know any administrator out there who would want to open up RPC on their firewall. And this is why remoting came out. And this is when PowerShell really started to take off because remoting, again, uses HTTP and SOAP and, and standards uh, that you don't have to worry about any sort of firewall setting. So if you want to do this kind of stuff, on a small network where you know, it does, your commands don't have to traverse firewalls and all that, you'll be fine. But once you, you're working in a bigger network where there's firewalls and intrusion detection systems and all kinds of other security stuff, then, uh, then yeah, you'll want to look at remoting. But uh, this computer name parameter, and there's a couple of other areas uh, inside of command lists that will use DCOM. Actually, WMI. All the WMI command lists use DCOM and RPC as well. Uh, but the new SIM command lists do not. So that's the big difference there, and, and, and just be careful, you know, when you're writing scripts using this. Uh, this is where remoting. Get into remoting, you won't have anything to worry about. And in the WMI CM, uh, CIM area, use the SIM commandlets rather than the WMI commandlets, and, and you'll be fine. All right. You still doing okay? You got time for another few? Sure. Keep them coming. All right. You're a champ, man. I love it. I'm, I'm dancing. Oh, I, don't, yeah. I don't have to go to the bathroom too bad. I'm all right. All right. Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy asks, where would we find a list of existing vendors that are partnering to use PowerShell? Oh, that's a great question too. Um, there is a module, there's a, I remember using a module search engine a while ago. Uh, I can look that one up, but there, there is a way. I just don't know that it's easy to get to. But generally what you'll do is if there's a specific vendor that you're looking for, just Google PowerShell module vendor name and you'll know if that vendor has any sort of uh, uh, a, a module containing commandlets that you can import and work with here uh, in PowerShell to hit that product. Uh, but I'll, I'll look for that because I swore I did that a while ago. Uh, there may be a repository out there with that information on there. All right. Uh, how about this one? This is kind of fun from Doug. Was there a run as different user option there? He didn't see it, but he may have missed it. 
Oh, that's a great question. Uh, no, there isn't. Well, let's, uh, there, let's hold shift down. I've never had to do that. Yeah, look at that. Boom. Run a different user. Yep. There you go. So that'll just, you know, like running anything else with a different user, it'll just run PowerShell.exe under those credentials. So obviously that user's going to need admin rights if, if, uh, if they're going to do anything across the network. Okay. So here's a fun question from Jonathan. Are PowerShell commands compatible with older versions of clients if you run commands remotely? Yes. Oh, that is a fantastic question. So again, that's one of the beautiful things about the PowerShell development team is they put a lot of PLC into ensuring that it's extensible and that it's backwards compatible. And if it's not, you'll know. So if you're trying to run a PowerShell 1 command through PowerShell 4 on another machine, absolutely it'll work because it's backwards compatible. But if you're going the reverse, a PowerShell 4 command against PowerShell 1, it's not going to work. But it's super easy to get PowerShell installed and updated across the network. You can use group policy for that, uh, or you can do it you know, manually. Uh, but that, great question, great question. Going backwards, fine. Going forward, depends on what you use. You know, some things will obviously work, but newer features and things won't work. All right. That's uh, one of the challenges of, of PowerShell across the enterprise, right? right? Is, uh, anything across the enterprise really is version compatibility. So. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, group policy will be your friend there to make sure that it's, it's updated across anything that you want to hit with PowerShell. Awesome. Good. And uh, CD is back with another question for us. How many, how many new features are in 4.0 versus 3.0? Would it be better to just start with the 4.0 nuggets when they are released? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot. I mean, from 3 was a major release because it really put PowerShell on the map. But 4 brought us some incredible features in things like DSC and, and a couple of other things, and it expanded and made other things much better. So I would start personally with 4 because we're going to cover everything that's in 3 and then some with, uh, with some of the new features that you know, everybody loves. And, and then PowerShell 5, there's even some, some more features, but not as much. Uh, 2 to 3 was a huge release, and 3 to 4 was a huge release. All the other ones were, were you know, not as big. Little, little features that will be easy to pick up. All right. Uh, and we actually have a question here from Wilson asking, how does PowerShell integrate with other applications, for example, MS Link? Well, a power, as I mentioned, uh, and this is only going to get bigger and, and, and uh, I don't know the word I'm looking for, more, more apparent as time goes on, but Microsoft is committed to putting PowerShell underneath everything, right? So if PowerShell is underneath everything and all the GUIs and everything we're used to using just execute PowerShell commands under the hood, well, then all we'll ever need going forward is PowerShell, right? So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's uh, the future here is, from a Microsoft side, the future is PowerShell. For, for, uh, and you also notice that if you're, if you're into certifications and things, you're going to start seeing PowerShell commands are making their way into all the products, SQL, Azure, uh, Windows. You're going to start seeing PowerShell questions come up everywhere. So. Yeah, it's, it's under everything. It's going to be in everything, and, and, and you're going to be speaking the PowerShell language here. Everybody's going to need to in the next five years. All right, and I think this is I don't our know last if that question. The question. <laughs> I, I think so. Let's go. And I think this is our last question from Peter. Is PowerShell case sensitive? Negative. It is not case sensitive. No. Nope. Uh, actually, you can see right here my Git service. Yeah, I'm going to get service for DC Nugget right here. It's going to work. It's thinking about working. It's going over to DC Nugget, which may have fell asleep on me. But no, no, to answer your question, Peter, it is not case sensitive. Nope. All right. Well, I think that's it for questions for us. So thank you guys so much for your time. Truly, truly appreciate all of your work and effort here. Um, and on behalf of all of us at CBT Nugget, everybody have a fantastic day. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thanks for joining and hanging out and asking questions. And uh, good luck with PowerShell. If you if you uh, if you learn it, I guarantee you you'll be you'll be uh, very happy that you did in a few years from now because it's going to be skills that we're all going to need. All right, that'll do it for us. Have a great day, everyone. All right, guys. Thanks. Take care.